the thought leak a show where we get the best thinking minds who generate big ideas right here which are immediately actionable today on the show we are going to discuss the prominent and the dominant role of the private equity industry to fuel the growth of the future champions of india and joining me on the discussion are luminaries charles k of warburg pinkers fondly known as chip and Cyril Shroff of Cyril Amarchand Mangaldas. Gentlemen, so good to have you on CNBC TV 18. Now, starting with you, Chip, of course, you have the vantage point of over $50 billion of assets under management across the globe, including India, in various sectors. Now, what is your thought process and perspective on how the economy is moving with this changing times where everything is rapidly changing? And what are the most important factors which are either worrying you or exciting you. Well, um, nice to see you, Nisha and Cyril. Delighted to get a chance to join. Thanks for the uh, invitation. Um, look, I think, you know, we're all experiencing a pretty, a, a truly unprecedented moment uh, as everywhere around the world struggles to manage through the COVID-19 crisis. And in some ways, we're still in the rather early in innings. If you wanted to think about it in sort of four stages, you know, we've lived through the lockdown phase. Um, to varying degrees in places around the world and, and feel as if in most places we've seen the worst of that. Um, we're now living through what some have called the dance as different places try to deal with outbreaks in certain spots and try to manage uh, the contagion, if you will. But we really haven't at all yet begun to really get back into that climb back, that return to normal and what it looks like. And uh, over the hill from that is obviously uh, the rebuilding and dealing with the overhang uh, created by all of this. So we still don't really know the direction or depth uh, of the crisis, nor what it really looks like on the other side. And every country around the world is dealing with it differently. You know, in the U.S., we've not had a particularly, we've had a particularly bad healthcare policy response, but a rather overwhelming policy response, both fiscal and monetary, uh, which is why you've seen the U.S., particularly in a market sense, uh, rebound uh, so strongly. Some ways you might say India has been the other way, which has had a had a fairly uh, dramatic uh, and comprehensive healthcare policy response, but it's had some less degrees of freedom in terms of its policy response. It's found ways to address some of the more obvious issues in rural India and the like, but it's largely counted on uh, the business sector and the individual to sort of manage through the crisis, just hoping that the return of normal, that release of the lockdown, would itself provide the economic ammunition to return and offloaded some of the, the offloaded of some of that burden on the banking system to manage through through the moratorium and the like. So you've seen different responses in different places in the world and we're at differing stages of of that sort of second stage, but it's still early innings and we really don't know exactly what this is all going to look like. Sir Shroff, what do you have to say about the present condition and in your view um, return to normal, or this being the new normal, when is the dust likely to settle? So it's going to be a while, and I think there'll be many twists and turns. But if I can sort of take a out to in view and with specific focus on you know private equity, which is kind of the theme of the day, is I believe that you know India continues to be solidly on the radar of global investors uh, like Chip, and for many reasons. I think there are some obvious pre-COVID reasons, such as our market, demography, basic rule of law, and a steady path of reform. So those reasons haven't gone away. They're still there. But looking at it now from a current and a kind of a pandemic, uh, uh, during pandemic lens, I think just as Chip said, you know, India has had a, a virus its infection numbers are rising because of the large population. I think it has been a very responsible healthcare response. I mean, we've not tried to hide anything. And the government has done uh, a lot in terms of trying to deal with uh, and control the infection numbers. But even during this, you know, I think there are a lot of opportunities uh, to be picked. I think there are tech and other industries that are going to be very relevant in a post-COVID scenario, just by the very nature of the need to be remote and the need to be digital. Uh, I think in a, you know, a six to nine months from now, we're going to see a lot of assets that are or will change hands There'll be a lot of value buys uh, at good valuations. And I think at the moment, as also leading up to sometime next year, I think there is going to be relatively less buying competition. So I think there's going to be a change in how deals are done. Right. 
how investment is approached and the shape and size of deals. So you'll see more buyouts. You know, Cyril, it's interesting because I, I think, you know, in many ways, I think right. your, your comments ring true relative to not only the, cri the, the COVID crisis, but many ways what you said was sort of what was happening before. I mean, the India story has been a compelling one for some time. Um, some pretty, you know, powerful tailwinds, demography and, yes. and, and many others, rapid urbanization, all those, you know, pose challenges, but they also is what creates the opportunity uh, in India. And um, I think, you know, private equity has a particularly useful role to play as sort of a, uh, a catalyzing agent in funding growth for India's next generation of entrepreneurs. And all of these challenges that you speak of, sort of the digitalization, technology, advance of business, a generational divide as you move from one generation to another, and sort of the global challenges of where India fits in the world, all of those are things that I think, you know, private equity for another generation of entrepreneurs will have an ability to be helpful with, not just capital, but the ability to bring with it uh, a variety of other sort of value-added capacity. So, I think India, you know, has always remained one of the, the more compelling stories. And I think uh, coming out of the crisis, it'll it'll be interesting to see whether, as with so many other things we're seeing, it acts a bit of an accelerant relative to that trend. Right. Uh, so, Chip, uh, uh, very important points made uh, by you. And, of course, the, the private equity trend has been shifting towards the buyouts. Now, given the current situation where a lot of companies are going to really struggle with the day-to-day -day operations, with the paucity of equity capital, private equity is likely to present uh, the most amount of risk capital for the country. What are the factors and the most exciting factors that you see right now uh, for investments in India? And any particular sectors, because we have specifically seen that uh, the fortunes have turned for some of uh, the pockets like telecom and digital space and even pharma while some of the other capital intensive sectors are really hungry for cash no i think you know i think the the, the core of the india story uh has always been uh kind of a domestic demand one um a continental sized economy young urbanizing at probably one of the more rapid rates of anywhere in the world uh, and that creates a, a sort of powerful set of tailwinds. And I think that relates to anything that sort of has that domestic uh, demand flavor to it. You know, not just in sort of a consumer retail healthcare yes. uh, dimension, but in financial services. And clearly this ability to leapfrog in a technology sense uh, is, uh, as, um, you know, presents a remarkable opportunity in India. You know, there is another there is another portion of the story re which relates to India's place in sort of a global supply chain. Um, I know, you know, Uday was on recently and spoke to India yes. uh, as the global office and the ability to kind of take off on the IT services story that's been powerful there and and how that develops over time. But there's also always been this sort of latent uh, manufacturing opportunity. And as companies look to sort of diversify their supply chains, there's at least the possibility uh, for India to play in that. There's clearly a set of real challenges associated with it, um, some of which yet aren't clear that they had addressed. Um, mm. But that, you know, the, the natural advantages to India are pretty compelling. When you think about in the world, where else could you go build another $10 trillion economy over the next uh, couple of decades? Uh, you know, India is really in a unique uh, audience of one. That doesn't mean it's preordained. There's a set of challenges to get there. But the raw elements of the story are quite compelling. All right. So uh, what I gather, the biggest takeaway from what you uh, uh, really said, uh, Chip, right now, uh, is that consumption, demand with our uh, demographic dividend that we have, but add to that the technology flavor. So that's the combination that probably most of the investors are eyeing. But Cyril Shroff, um, how can we really capitalize on the kind of interest that private equity industry is showing in India right now? What are the changes that India can make so that we are more palatable to the global investor community? So I'll just first begin with, uh, you know, how important uh, private equity funding is, and then I'll come to the changes. So India is going to need a mountain of risk capital, both of scale and of sophistication, for various reasons. It needs to clean up its uh, financial system. It needs to clean up uh, the assets in the real economy. 
and it's also a very it provides a very interesting transitional lever in in corporates which are in the stage of uh, either uh, sort of pivoting on their business model or from an intergenerational point of view as well our capital markets do not have that same level of depth the indian entrepreneurs have run out of cash so by elimination i think the only uh, uh, source of uh, risk capital of scale is private equity and they also provide a very interesting partnership yes. model i think we need two things first we need to create the right general conditions for entry and investment and also on governance and specifically for uh, for private equity i think yes. we need to create a very clear efficient fdi regime so even just now things like quest note 3 and there are good reasons for that i think all of that stuff has to be clear because these are just creating regulatory cholesterol that's one the second i think is we and we'll build on this a little later is we need a very efficient going private regime it's almost impossible to go private uh, in india once you're in the public market we have a hotel california problem you know you can check in but you can't check out uh and finally i think we need a a very strong rule of law based enforcement system of contract because a lot of these investment pieces are based on a set of sophisticated contracts and you need to make sure that they are enforceable so that's on the entry part right and on governance i think okay. that's the second big topic we right. need market driven right. governance and in the last 10 15 years we've right. seen regulator driven governance which is essentially form right. over substance a lot of it is tick the box I think it's time we get in uh the time we get in really market driven governance which is driven by the likes of chips firm uh, or the black rocks and vanguards of the world and that's when the real change uh, will come and the last point and I think we can build on that is we need to fundamentally move away from the concept of promoter into a concept of a controlling shareholder because it brings with it a lot of changes which are going to be very relevant. Right so Cyril Shroff you've beautifully summarized the various aspects that needs to be done. In fact we will get the global investors view on all of these aspects when we return on the Thought League back after a very short break. Uh, stay tuned. Welcome back you're watching the Thought League and um, Charles K of Warburg Pinkus as well as Cyril Shroff of Cyril Amarchand Mangal Das are discussing the growing role of private equity investments for furthering the future growth of many Indian champions of tomorrow. Now Cyril Shroff made a lot of pertinent points. Now Chip I want to get your view on this. Are these issues really unique to India? What are these basic issues which are unique to India in your view and which needs an immediate change so that we capitalize on the demand and the attractiveness that we are presenting right now to the global investors like yourself? Sure. Well, I think you know Cyril summarized it well and you know what's clear is India is at a stage where it needs a you know significant uh, influx of capital that 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 catalyzes uh not just another generation of businesses but frankly a generation of businesses that are living through generational divides themselves or a different set of global challenges or a technology divide or the like and i think elsewhere in the world we've seen private equity sort of uh play that role it's had a long history in india you know we've obviously been there ourselves for 25 years uh and i and while there have been places in which we've been control shareholders over the years You know, a lot of what we've done has been more of this partnership with management uh, to grow and build a, a business, often one that had had existed before. Um, so there's a flexibility uh, to private equity that's always been attractive. But what's clear is the scale's growing, and there's the opportunity, as Cyril said, I think, to increasingly uh, not just be that strong minority partner, but to be in control and have a more collaborative. a uh, relationship with management beyond sort of the promoter language but a place that has a a different set of governance standards uh that um you know are more sophisticated in in some ways you know i i think that opportunity is very clearly there some of it you know we've already seen so we we see what's all coming i think as it relates to the challenges of india you know it often right. all gets put under the guise of ease of doing business uh and it's clearly been a focus of the government for right. some time but the reality is that there are there is still uh at times as Cyril described sort of an overly prescriptive mindset as opposed to one that sets the corridors of what's acceptable or not and makes it easier to navigate through 
um, you know, things where you it has a more predictable dimension, less sort of selectively enforced. And uh, I think it's that predictable environment that investors are looking for um, that will propel things. Clearly, the government gets it. And you see it not only in that, you see it in, you know, startup India and self-reliant India and dimensions of, of trying to create that opportunity uh, for India. And I, I think there's a, there is, though, another few turns of the screwdriver and continuing focus, as I said, on creating more of a environment that is sort of has a predictable dimension to it, uh, focused around that ease of doing business. Right, Chip, uh, let's address the elephant in the room, which uh, Cyril Shroff had really hinted at. Is it time now that India really sheds that promoter culture and that promoter tag? Uh, is it now archaic and move more towards institutional capital and corporatization? Well, I, I think I think I, you know I, I think that's I think Cyril made the point rather eloquently uh, that you know there are there's a, both a connotation and a legal dimension to that uh, that I think you know had uh, you know had served India well, but it's evolved in many ways past that, uh, and uh, I think especially as you think about. Um, private equity as a source of finance to fund growth for the next generation of entrepreneurs, that may group be a group of people that has less access to its own capital. Um, so that that unifying of management and finance gets separated in ways that allow companies to be built by another generation of people that may not be of means, but are of vision. Um, and private equity has a unique role to play where it can right. function in many ways, perhaps as a control player, but without the dimensions of control that are seen in generational terms. As Cyril hinted at, it's a, it's a style of capital that comes, provides not just capital, but a range of resources around subject matter connectivity, global connectivity, managing over those digital divides, you know, brings with it a strong sense of governance, a commitment to ESG and engagement uh, in the communities we invest, creates entities that then can survive well past them as they exit. Uh, and that's why I think, you know, I, I, but I think that, I think Cyril spoke well about needing to kind of some of the regulatory environment changes that are necessary uh, for that, for that vision to play out. Right. So Cyril, uh, let me uh, pick your brain on one aspect, which sounded very interesting for letting companies or the foreign investors uh, be able to uh, take the companies private if it's a buyout situation. What regulatory changes are required there? And do you think the regulators are open th to these ideas? I think you first need to make sure that the ownership uh, comes completely, almost 100% in the hands of the incoming uh, buyout investor. There are two big hurdles in the way just now. One is the delisting regime, which has mm -hmm. got this uh, reverse book building hurdle to it. And we've been trying to shed it for uh, more than a decade uh, unsuccessfully. And the other in our companies act, we don't have a proper squeeze out regime as well. So the most countries in the world will have that. And the reason for this still continuing is that there was abuse uh, of these provisions in the past. There are people who kind of played, uh, played a game uh, on the minority shareholders. But we can't let that be a hurdle forever. So I, I actually believe that this uh, lack of a going private regime is like one huge boulder uh, on the on the road to bringing in the the billions of dollars, and that needs to be fixed quickly. You just need to shed the old mindset that going private is a bad thing. It should be as easy to come into the market as it should be going out of the market. We have to get rid of this hotel California problem, because otherwise you actually not you create a huge disincentive for people to go to public markets in the first place. And you know that you can exit, you know that some uh, exit smoothly in a fair and transparent way. I think that will solve the problem. I think this is a massive uh, restriction on the real billions coming in. So we are just now getting investments in grams. If you want investment in kilograms, you better get rid of this problem. Uh, and this is one one uh, one thing that really needs to be done. Chip All wants right. to say something. No, I would just just to add maybe a couple of points to what Cyril said. You yes, know, one sir. I would just just to clarify, and I think. You know, while private equity, uh, as we've discussed, has the ability to have control or, or you know, significant majority of business in a buyout transaction, you know, I'd say we probably never really own all of something because our core DNA is still always about partnering with management teams to grow and build a business. And so that's always going to be a collaborative venture, which is why this distinction yeah. of control versus not or promoter versus not 
But that relationship is always important. And private equity is seen as this transition agent that can accelerate growth, but then ultimately moves on and leaves behind a valuable, vibrant, growing business that's, you know, uh, engaged in its community and, and, and lives beyond uh, the investment itself. The, the part that I think Cyril's getting at is there's always been, uh, right. I think, anywhere around the world, a desire on the part of business community and the regulatory uh, agencies to want to protect what are seen as important, fundamental, strategic businesses in a country uh, from and have them be held in more of a domestic, uh, in, in held by domestic shareholders or have domestic content to them in some ways that makes them less vulnerable uh, to a hostile action in some ways. My only point would be is there's, that's a perfectly reasonable set of objectives. They're simply not inconsistent with what Cyril just said. I think there's a way to provide appropriate protections uh, to corporations, especially those that, that may be deemed to have strategic value in a country. Everywhere around the world has versions of that. But that need not get in the way of everything that Cyril spoke about, which is the ability for those businesses that are, you know, maybe more, you know, less well managed, less value, you know, uh, going through generational change, having already diffused shareholding base, the opportunity of being a single unifying transaction that removes that company from the public markets, enables it to grow in a different environment outside all of the constraints that it can exist in a public environment and perhaps return or not at some point in the future. I think Cyril's getting at an right. important point, but just to address the issue, I don't think it's inconsistent with what are a legitimate set of interests for the business or regulatory community to protect dimensions of that. All right, so some very, very important points made by both Chip as well as Cyril. And the most important aspect and the key takeaway that is coming out is that ease of doing business, which also means that the mindset must change for the foreign investors to be taken on board on companies. That's one of the most important aspects that the companies and the regulators can really work upon. With that, it's a wrap on this edition of the Thought League. Thanks so much, Chip, as well as Cyril, joining, for joining us with your key insights as well as the big ideas. And thanks to all the viewers for tuning in.